I think when we look at the beef industry today and the opportunities that are there, um, ultimately, we have more opportunities than any time in my lifetime. And I think uh, a lot like what we do in all phases of life, if we get back to the basics and think about what we're trying to do and, and design cattle with the end in mind. And, uh, you know, sometimes we hear that there's just no opportunity there. And I think when we think about opportunity, if we will consider what leads to value. So when we think about what consumers want from beef, they want that great taste and the protein that's offered there. That very dense protein that allows us to, to have a, a very enjoyable meal uh, that, that fits our diet so extremely well. So when we look at designing cattle for ourselves or for our customers, uh, we often talk about calving ease because we want that live calf first. But we're simultaneously looking at 20 plus genetic predictions. And that includes calving ease, that includes stature, as in we don't want them too big. And then within those parameters, we select for efficient growth, provided it comes in a superior end product merit and the right maternal function to replicate the process. So if you're watching this with us, you're thinking, well, that's not that hard. But I think when you look at the discipline that it requires to make those selections, it is so important that we use the cattle that are truly superior. You know, so when we think about that and we think about what drives the value of beef, we track lots of cattle through U.S. premium beef and other other quality based grids and you know the last 12 months we have tracked 6,000 head of cattle that are worth six dollars and 92 cents more per hundredweight because of marbling you know all the efficiency of those pounds all of the gain and all of the other traits that are there are so so important but when we look at what differentiates beef by the pound we have to do it by a taste basis and marbling is what gives us that taste. And if we do that, that is what differentiates true value of beef per pound. So let's take it back a step and let's think a little bit about what does it take to add value in the beef industry? And, and I'll go back to some of Henry's rules of just, you know, this beef industry is pretty simple. You know, if you'll have a herd health program, give them something to eat. And then you use genetics of merit you're going to be pretty unique in this industry. So when we talk about value and we talk about the cattle that, that people are going to want, they're going to want healthy cattle. They're going to want cattle that will grow fast and efficiently. They're going to want cattle that hang up on a value-based grid that has more value. We've actually tracked 104,000 head of cattle, specifically Gardner Angus Ranch sired cattle, since 1998. And those cattle have averaged over $91 per head above the base price since 1998. That's real money. Give them something to eat, have a herd health program, use known quantity genetics of merit, and you will be successful. You know, the question is often if I use cattle with end product merit, what will I compromise? nothing. Marbling is free. If you look at all the, the research that is there and you look at uh, literature reviews done as long ago by Twig Marston of Kansas State University um, 20 some years ago, there's a 0 .001 correlation between end product merit and fertility reproduction. If you look at a more recent review of all the literature that's out there, that same 0.001 by Virginia Tech. And so when we look at these traits, these highly heritable traits, you know, reproduction is the number one performance trait. It's lowly heritable, about 0.1. We manage reproduction. We only keep and multiply the cattle that will settle in a time-restricted breeding season. If they don't breed, we make food out of them. We get carcass data. We enter, the, enter uh, feeding the nation with those cattle. But then we look at the highly heritable traits, those growth traits, uh, weaning, yearling, 
carcass weight, those are all 0.4 or higher heritable. The same way with end product merit. When we look at marbling and muscle and fat, those are also highly heritable. So I like to, to joke with our customers and, and when we think about this, this isn't brain surgery. It's really not that hard. I can add value by using elite bulls in the Angus breed for these traits of merit and I can do it so much better than when I was a kid. The bulls we have today versus 30 years ago, we never even dreamed of those kind of bulls. We have cattle that have more calving ease, more growth, more marbling, more muscle, more maternal function, more heifer pregnancy, reproductive ability than we've ever had in our lifetime. And so what really bewilders me so much is in the, in the age-based information age we live in, you know, where everything is at our fingertips, my goodness, people use that data. It is right there and it's at your fingertips and it's, maybe it's so easy. I remember sitting at the kitchen table or laying in the bean bag and charting these old paper sire summaries to find the bulls that fit that one at a time going through 3,000 bulls and I'd narrow it down to about 20 bulls and then I'd research those bulls further. And we made genetic change very drastically by using those progeny proven bulls. Now we have genomics and our batting average goes up so much more and we can use those bulls so much younger. We know we're going to make a directional change for the positive of cattle of merit because of all this technology. And sometimes I think in this uh, age of information there is so much noise out there that we forget to use the information. And if we will just use that information you can make so much better decision that will not only be more profitable for you, it'll also be better for the beef industry because it's going to make consumers more satisfied with the greatest tasting beef in the world. So if we work with, with those genetics, you know, and I oftentimes want to hear about how cattle customers want to talk about or just people in the cattle industry talk about how tough their cattle are. Well, we all live in environments that are less than ideal. Uh, that's why we have beef cattle operations, because we have these cattle that will go eat cellulose that we can't eat and convert it into this great tasting beef. But we have weather, whether it's floods or blizzards or fires or droughts, you know. It takes a heck of an animal to be able to, to reproduce in these conditions, but we can do that. And so if we'll put them in a position to succeed reproductively, which is primarily giving them enough forage or the proper nutrition to be able to conceive, if we work with our veterinarian to make sure that we appropriately inoculate those cattle against the major respiratory diseases and, uh, you know, the herd health has come just as far as, as genetics has. And so, if we'll make those decisions and partner up with our veterinarian whose job it is to know these things, we're going to have more success. We often work on a daily basis with customers wanting to sell their cattle, whether it be at weaning or, or coming off wheat pasture, or coming off grass as a yearling, or headed to the feed yard. And you have to have more information to document if nothing else, I mean, I can take the averages of the bulls that you've used and I can put that together. Talk about where they rank within the Angus population for the things we've talked about, growth and marbling and muscle. And all of a sudden, we, we have more value there because we have communicated that information. Now we add into that, this is their background. They've been on grass this long or they've been on wheat this long or they've been in the background in the yard this long and this is what they weigh. And instead of saying, well, I think they'll weigh five and then they weigh 650, we got scales, let's weigh them. Let's see what they weigh, okay? And then, then I take, here's their herd health program, or I even go further and I show all of their performance for the previous year, the preceding years, and I share that information. I mean, one of the real struggles that often happens in the beef industry is it's a skin thy neighbor approach in that we don't want to share information because if I have that information then I, you know, I, if I share that with you then you're going to want more money for your cattle. 
Well, you should want more money for your cattle if you know more what those cattle will do. And, and really, if you've got a, a herd health program, a forage program, and those cattle have been weaned appropriately, they're going to be worth more. And I think that it's, it behooves you and the buyers to work together on that. And you share that information, you both get better, you both have a better chance of profitability. When we talk about demand-driven markets and we talk about giving the consumer what they want, I believe there's no greater illustration than the Certified Angus Beef Program. And you look at what they've done just to barely survive and get started and, and go through all the growing pains they went starting in 1978 to where this past year they sold 1 billion, 121 million pounds of Certified Angus Beef. That's exciting. That's important to all of us in the beef industry because you look at that demand-driven market. And that's not the cheap stuff. That's the very best beef in the world that people want to pay for. They just want to get more of it. And the projections as we speak are for certified Angus beef to blow past that record again. That's value. That's opportunity. And so when we look at, they have a program called Targeting the Brand. And these guys are my friends, and I look at them as a necessary part of our, our business. Their specs are not good enough. They say 0 0.53, 0 0.54 marbling uh, for targeting the brand. We're here in Ashland, Kansas, nearby there. And the last thing on earth I ever want to be is the most average seed stock producer on earth. I want to be the best that I can possibly be. And being slightly above breed average for marbling is not enough to make a directional change. So my friends John Sticka, Mark McCulley, the Board of Directors of Certified Angus Beef and the Board of Directors of American Angus Association, I challenge you to raise those specs. I understand the need for inclusivity. But if you want to make a directional change and you want to make vegetarians beef-eating addicts, as Henry Gardner would say, quit messing around and let's use a higher percentile for the traits that make money for beef producers, the traits that make consumers happy and want to buy more certified Angus beef.